Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Some days we will publish some samples for you of our newest and greatest art instruction videos. And today is no exception. We have a brand new one from Michael Holter, the great watercolor artist, teaching you how to do watercolor from photographs. I hope you enjoy this. So now that I've dried this thoroughly, there is no more moisture in this paper, I can begin to put another layer on here. I could have painted right into that wet area and made some clouds and done some things, but I really wanted to uh, break it down a little bit into pieces. So the first thing I want to do in uh, developing this painting is to create some distance in the background. One of the things about painting a realistic or representational painting, even if it is an impressionistic painting, is that I want to give you the impression, the viewer, the impression that there's depth, that they're stepping into this scene. I want it to be able to uh, carry you into the painting. I want your eye to travel through it. I want it to have a pleasing effect in many ways, but mainly what I want to try to do is create depth. So what I'm going to start with is another attempt here uh, at wetting this sky and creating some atmosphere back and back, especially back here and some over here. I can go right over this lighthouse building that I put in here. It doesn't really matter if it's, uh, if it's painted with a little extra color on it because it's going to be a pretty much a silhouetted uh, building. But my horizon line, my eye level is kind of my key here. I want everything above that eye level line now to be um, have some more value. I'm going to wet it down and I'm going to make some interesting, hopefully some interesting clouds and some interesting trees in the background. Now, with watercolor, you never really know um, when you paint this style, this method, exactly what you're going to end up with. If I was a photorealist, I would be painting a different way and you would have a better uh, idea before you started, but um, not the way I like to paint. So I'm going to take and um, add a bit of color into the sky uh, that is not, not a lot of color, but uh, some interesting formations at least. Um, so I think I want this design to kind of carry your eye around, so I think I need something up in this uh, left side. So I'm going to make a little bit of a tone here with some of the colors I've already been using. Uh, this ultramarine blue will be my blue here. Burnt sienna, my favorite two colors to mix. A little bit of alizarin to warm it up a little bit. Get, get a gray. Need a little more. I'm going to make a blue-gray, see what that does. I don't want too much moisture on my brush. Take some of it off on the sponge and just see what it looks like, okay? Just put it on there and see what happens. Um, looks a little dry, so I don't want to waste too much time. I want to get this in. Um, let's uh, dry this brush a little bit. I need a paper towel here. Take and just soften some of this and uh, create a little bit of a randomness to these clouds. Maybe a little more solid bit right there. So this is kind of a windswept clouds rolling in kind of thing. And we want to have a little bit of a um, uh, warmth on this side, on the right side. Let's pick up a little bit of this alizarin and a little bit of this raw sienna, just a tad to kind of give it a little warmth. That's a little more than I wanted. Let's rinse that out, get some of that off. 
So these clouds have a little bit of color to them. Now, the section along the bottom here is an important part. This is where my distant trees are going to be. I'm going to use these same colors that I've got going here. A little bit more pigment. A little bit of quinacridone gold to green it up a little bit. But I don't want too much vibrancy to it. I want it very subtle and neutral. Um, a gray kind of color. Let's try a little bit and see what happens here. So my photograph that I'm working from has a, um, these trees that are kind of windswept out here. It's really the interesting way that these trees will um, uh, develop when they're along the water like that. There's these pines that just swoop and have this wonderful um, texture to them. And you see them all lined up and they're across this kind of a ridge back in here. So I want to develop this feeling of these trees. I'm using this long um, uh, neaf brush. It's a, um, actually a rigger to get some of that feeling in there. Some of these trees actually go up into here. Might as well put some of that in, a little variety. So there's some warmth there, there's some tone there. Um, this can, I don't need to go too far down into the base here. I'm going to fix that up later. This is going to be darker in here when I get back to this. So I've got it pretty nice and hazy. I like that. And there's going to be some color over here. Now I've got a little, a little spray mister here. Mist that a little bit to get it moist, to keep it moist. Let's put some of this color So I'm just creating the shapes here, these big shapes. That's what I want, big shapes right now, right down to that horizon line. And I'll, I'll work into that later with some other, other, uh, other things as we go down lower. But that's my, uh, my initial, uh, initial wash here. Now, uh, I want to watch it because this is drying, and I, I want to make sure that I'm keeping it interesting. Now, the further back it is, it, it's good to have it val the value be light and soft, but up in here where it's a little closer, perhaps I could darken it just a tad, pull a little bit more dark value. I got a little sepia on my brush there. Let's just darken some of this up in this area here, down in the lower parts. Light gets, it, there's more shadows down lower in, under the trees and so on when you get, when you get down into like a forest or something, but here's Here's this light coming from the right side, and it's going to get brighter over here, and it's going to get a little bit more subtle, but darker over here. So I'm mixing into the wet pigment. So it's, in a sense, I am, I'm creating a little bit of a wet in the wet uh, painting here. Now the tree trunks are going to go that direction over here because they're windswept off the ocean. And I want to I'll build that up a little darker later I think when it gets a little drier. Now I've got this area around the building here. Now the building itself is going to be pretty dark, but I'm going to push it back a little darker around it. So let me go a little more blue. Blue is a, the cool colors like blue are going to recede. Warm colors are going to come forward, generally speaking. So if I um, cool this down back here, it will recede. 
and go behind this. And here's the roof line. And um, there's a roof line right there. I'm just going to try to catch that right now and get that in. And there is a, there is a fence along here. Um, it's like a, a rail fence. And a lot of times lighthouses, you know, you see a lighthouse and it's, it, they have a picket fence, like especially the ones out east and the, you know, those romantic ones. Well, I mean, no reason why I couldn't turn this into a picket fence. So I'm just going to add some negative painting here. Now again, this is back to the principles of design. Repetition is one of those principles. So when you add, add a repetitious thing like that, it is a recognizable thing. It is a object and a shape that people respond to. They, they like seeing something repeated. It helps them to visualize what it is they're looking at. So that color is kind of nice. It's a little harder edged right there, and that's where the, the um, uh, edge of the trees are, and a little softer over here. That works fine. Um, we could add a little more of this into some of these areas here, maybe. But I want that atmospheric feel. Now, I'm, I could, if I felt like it got away from me and I didn't get it in there, and I wanted it in there, I could use a little bit of white pigment into my paint to give it some of that soft, hazy look. Now, um, I don't think I have to. I kind of like, well, like what I've got going. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a, a tool in, in my other paintings. I oftentimes plan for that. And this one here, uh, because it is uh, a sort of atmospheric distance here, I don't really think I need to. I think I've already got it fairly well captured. Putting a little top on some of these, they're kind of these pine tree things sticking up here. Um, and on this side of the photo, over here, I have a, um, it's a darker area because it's coming forward over the top of this lighthouse. So the lighthouse is probably my next shape and feature that I need to bring into focus. Uh, and then I'll work my way down into the cliffs. So that's the, the start of that. I'll put a little dark in here just to add some variety. Again, this is still damp, so what I've got there is a miniature little wet in the wet area. The paper is dry, except for this area that I put pigment on now. And this is all drying. It's not all done yet, but it's getting there. I think I'll break up this a little bit in here, leave some little bits of white. And actually, they aren't white. That's the light part of the paper. So now that we've painted the uh, tree line and the uh, distant trees and uh, worked our way a little bit into the foreground, uh, I should say worked a little way into the middle ground, um, now we can add the uh, lighthouse itself, the building structure, and then uh, some other tree value um, structures that will bring it forward a little bit more. So we want to get this distant values. And then the middle ground, and we're going to come into the foreground down here on the cliffs and really bring it, bring it stronger. So we've got to keep building our values as we go. Now, I don't want to have the, the, uh, the lighthouse structure too pale. Um, so I want to uh, build up a little bit of value, but I don't want it as dark as what it's going to be in the foreground. So I'm taking the same color that I colors that I have mixed on my palette and what I often refer to is my stew. This uh, stew that I create here has a variety of colors in it. And um, to keep color harmony throughout the painting, again, that's one of those principles of design, keeping the same basic mixture of colors or keeping a limited palette of colors can really help, uh, help your painting hold together and uh, 
develop a, a, into a, a solid structure um, without, uh, you know, so you don't bounce around too much with colors that don't fit. Um, so let's just see what we have here. Now when you put a color like that down, it might be a little too dark, but it's going to lighten down something like that. So let's just start with this little structure here and see what happens. We can, uh, using, a, using this Velvet Touch long round brush, it's a really cool long brush made by uh, Princeton, Princeton Brush Company. And it um, has a long point, very, very handy to have a brush that can, can do multiple things. I can do round um, wash type things like a round brush but I also have this fine detail that I can get with this point. So the, the um, you know, I've got a few details in here and um, get this to uh, start coming together here. And I can change my color as I go, which I like to do. I uh, don't want to do too much warm tones on this because it is in the distance. So let's put a little Let's throw another little blue in there. We'll use some cerulean early on in the sky and so on. Let's put a little of that into this area here to keep it cool, keep it distant, but just to change the color a little bit. And then I add some water to my brush and just sort of drag some of that into a, and so I have a little bit of variation. Again, a gradation from one color to another or from one value to another. Typical watercolor treatment and technique. Some of the secrets and tips that you can pull into your watercolor are just basic um, to art and painting in general. So you don't need to apply these only to watercolor if you happen to be an acrylic painter or um, paint in other, other media. Uh, but this is really good for watercolor in particular. I'm going to put a little alizarin on my brush. And again, I'm not going to try to um, copy what is here. I am looking at this as a shape that I'm going to um, utilize in this painting, but it doesn't have to be painted exactly as it is. So here is the... Um, there's some things coming off here, railings and things, just marking those up. Here's the uh, roof line here. We'll probably need to pull a little warm tones into the face of this uh, uh, lighthouse. And actually, now that I think about it, a little warmth a little orange dropped into this side of this part of the um, lighthouse itself is a good idea. I've got the sun coming in here. It definitely should be warmer on that side, even though the whole thing is going to be quite cool. I have a roof line back here. And a roof line here. And I want to just keep that kind of neutral. Using the colors on my brush, on my palette, I'm not really trying hard to copy the colors that are on the photograph. Um, that can be done. That can be a way to paint. Uh, don't necessarily need to do that. Again, for sake of color harmony, uh, sometimes it's better to, to not do that, to uh, make your painting stand alone as a, um, a unique color rend rendition of, of this place. A little bit of a dormer here comes out. It's got a window on, on the front of it. And there's a overhang here. And there's a roof line there. So I'm trying to capture a lot of this by painting negative shapes around some of these things. There's a a little bit of a 
If the sun is hitting this at all, there would be a cast shadow coming off there and a shadow off this side of this little building or this entryway, whatever it is. And uh, doorway somewhere in there. Just put, I'm just indicating these very, very generally. Not, not much. I'm going to put a little more warmth in a couple of these spots. A little too much there. If you put too much color on, you can always lift it back with your brush. Now I may come back here and, and um, put a little more value onto this, these pieces here, the roof line and so on. They're pretty white on the paper, even though I have some tone on there. Um, don't want them to be you know, too much of an attention getter, but I do want it to be you know, somewhat important. So it's, it's one of those balancing things you've got to judge along the way what you want to emphasize. So that works. Now my, my trees in the foreground here have to get a little stronger. Um, so let's, um, let's just stay with these same colors I've been using. Uh, stay in my stew. Stay in your lane. Don't uh, try to get out of it too rapidly unless there's a car coming at you in that lane, you might want to move, but anyway. So let's just see what we got here. We don't want to go too dark, but a little bit of um, value here that can bring this a little darker and a little more forward. Now this brush, I'm just using the side of it I'm using it uh, as a, a bit of a drawing tool because it's got a great point here for these branches. But on the side of it, you can use it more as a, as a um, broad stroke tool. A lot of different tools that you can use to make uh, paintings work. Some of them are going to be traditional tools, some of them not. Um, so here I want to make sure that I'm not uh, taking your eye off the edge too much. I don't want to get too dark over on the far side. I want your interest to be in this area over here. Now there's going to be light coming in here and there's a more of a, a little more green tone to the grasses. Now I don't want to go crazy with my green at this point because I haven't been I want to keep my colors pretty subtle. So when I make my greens, I use ultramarine blue, cronacridone gold, and burnt sienna to create a green that is neutral. It can have different tones to it. It can be more blue. It can be more, more green, more yellow. But it has a nice variety of color to it. So on the ground here, in the foreground, there's going to be this shadow shape coming off the trees if the you know again if the if this um, uh, tree is catching some light and there's going to be some other shadow shapes from bushes and things so there's going to be some things going on in here uh, the photograph doesn't really show any of that uh, I'm going to go a little bit more into the quinacridone gold make a little more of a yellow grass color. And the way the light hits it, there's, there's a bit of this color coming across there. A little bit of it here along the area where the, where the sun hits this ridge. And there's wonderful uh, colors on some of these plants that that are on these these cliffs there's r reds and oranges and wonderful colors but I'm going to keep this pretty simple 
So that's pretty much that for now, unless I go any darker up into these here. So I put a little more pigment on there. Also, another thing that I'll do, another trick, uh, secret that you can use, uh, is to make a nice little dark. I'm going to use my stew again, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna. So while this is drying over here on this on these trees, but in order to give it a little bit of interest and volume, I protect it with my hand or something, protect the sky, and then drop in some color by flicking the brush and let that create the textures that we want. So you can get a lot of interesting textures that way. And, and, when, and trees, particularly, will catch the light in different areas in different ways. So sometimes it's it's the perfect way to add some uh, foliage into a tree, to add some color. If you push around the brush, a brush too much, paint too much into it, you can get a, um, some mud that develops. And that's because you are pushing around the uh, pigments instead of letting them do their thing. I could even spray it with water, drop in some water. There's a lot of things you can do to uh, in create interest in here. That was just a little bit of a little bit of plain water right there. Just to give a little interest to it, not to make it too too complicated. So now the next step on this uh, portion here is to go back into the background over here. There's a part of this cliff is way in the distance, and I need to make sure that I keep that light and hazy. So in order to do that, I need to have uh, a additional pigment place there that is um, uh, either I'm going to have to use some actual opaque whites in there or I'm going to have to um, keep it thin. Now one of the challenges of keeping pigment thin is just that. It's all water and there isn't a lot of pigment and you end up sometimes with a uh, rather washed out uh, area when it dries. So Sometimes it's good to um, think about it in terms of what can I do, what is the secret here, what kind of trick can I use to create depth uh, that has some substance to it. And one of the ways to do that is to add some body color, add some white. I don't want the eye going off over here, so I'm going to make sure there's no little white areas there. I'm going to put a little... Uh, raw sienna in here to make it a little warmer in some spots. These little cliffs. But all this is really now wet into wet right in here. So let's do it. Let's put a little white in there and see what we can do with that. Here's some white opaque um, titanium white watercolor paint. And what it does kind of keeps keeps the, the body of the of the pigment there and lets you uh, create some interesting light values that you can't really do with just thin down um, watercolor. It can get muddy if you overdo it. You got to make sure you don't overdo it. Now I'm going to come back in there with some more details, of course. So I'm going to put a few um, darks along the base here of this. There are little rocks and things here that are catching the light. And there are some uh, various areas where it's darker and the, the cliff has these uh, little f um, features that kind of Create these angles. So adding that in there now, while it's still wet, create some interest without getting too busy and not doing it when it's dry. Because I want that to be diffused, almost like an out-of-focus camera. So the next cliff up here is uh, quite lit and more. Uh, there's some shadows on it, but there's more going on here. Then there's some big dark shadows that come here. And there are some bright areas of orange where the cliffs 
uh, pick up the orange of um, uh, probably it's iron or whatever it is in, in, the, in, the, in the rock, in the stone. Um, I also have this, um, this area of water over here that I need to consider myself, concern myself with. And at some point I need to put that in, but I think I'll stay on the cliff for now. Let's start with, um, we'll start with this area in here and we'll work our way forward. Most of this is gonna be done with the ultramarine blue burnt sienna mixture with a little bit of the um, raw sienna in it. I don't want it real dark here. I want it darker than that. But this over here is where my real darks are gonna be. So let's just start with this and see what we have here. I'm leaving a little bit of that under, that color that we put on first, which was a very, um, very pale uh, raw sienna that can give us some of these uh, shapes that, we that are already there. And we're going to just, I'm using a fairly small brush right now because we're still in this background area. So I'm looking for interesting colors, mixture of colors. Here's some orange I'm going to put in there to br you know, bring that orangey tone into there. This goes right up to another rock that is quite dark, but I'm going to, and I'll leave that for now. Okay, keep going. Looking for areas that um, that have um, light hitting them. Accidental little shape there that I can turn into a rock. I don't have to paint every rock the way it is on the photo, obviously. Again, I don't want to go real dark. I'm kind of getting a little too dark in some areas, I think. I'll keep it, keep it light. Let's go a little cooler. A little more blue right in here, so it's a little more gray. You add blue to this mixture, it grays it down a little bit, cools it. Use the fingernail and scrape a little bit, give a little texture to it, a little mark here and there. You can use a palette knife or a back of a credit or edge of a credit card works real good. Probably better to use a credit card for scraping than it is for spending. So a little more orange down in here where the light hits. And now this is the edge, this is de demarcation right here where it gets real dark. Um, uh, right in here is the real dark area. Okay, I'm gonna put, put this in right up to this edge and then and we're gonna go right around here. So I need to put a little more pigment in here. And maybe a little sepia just to darken that up a little. So this this is all much more dark than um, than the other parts. And there's some dark on this ridge. And we can put a little of that in and let it bleed. And this is quite dark in here. but not as dark as what's going to come further up. But this is my, my, my eye um, line here. I want this to bring your eye up. So I want it to be interesting. I want it to be colorful. I want some darks. Um, a little bit of everything on this. Okay. 
So here's another. So everything I do now has to get increasingly darker, increasingly more value to it as I go up here into these areas. And I'm, I'm, I still, I'm looking at the shape that's there, not painting every little object. I'm looking at the shape that's formed by the, uh, the way the light hits it. Um, that's a more value there. I am looking at the photograph now, trying to make sure I get everything somewhat in order the way I want it. I'm going to take a clean and damp brush, soften some of these edges. I like the light shape I have there, but I need to put a little tone on here. And it just so happens that on the photograph, this is all green, and it looks like it's turning kind of green by the way I'm doing this. So that was a, one of those happy accidents that happens in watercolor. This, uh, these rocks right here are more, should be more gray. Um, they're kind of standing up taller, a little angled like that. And there's a little pile of rock out here. And I'm doing this, you know, again, right from, right from the shapes that are on the photo. So. softening of some of the edges where the where the rocks um, the light rolls around the edge of the rock uh, they're not all just square chunky spaces like I've created up in here there's some things that are bleeding a little bit I want to just take care of some of that and make marks there use my fingernail love this color I got there it's a beautiful color and it's just darker than that even though it's still a little wet it looks like it's going to stay a little dark, so I'm going to put a little extra pigment in there just to make sure. I'm going to put a little darker stuff right in a couple of spots here to give it a little more variety. It's still wet enough to do that. Hi, I'm Michael Holter, and welcome to my landscape workshop. In this workshop, I'll take you through many steps that uh, you'll find very helpful as you paint landscapes. I'll talk about depth and distance and atmosphere, talk about putting together images that uh, maybe are from different scenes altogether and putting them together into a, a, a reliable uh, subject. And we'll uh, talk about the colors needed and the way to proceed from uh, light to dark values. The uh, very unique thing about the way I present this workshop is that I will let you in on all the decision making that I go through. I will uh, really give you a sense of the steps taken and uh, sometimes even the mistakes I make as we go. It'll be a great way to learn. I love painting landscapes. They are a great way to uh, capture the places that I go and travel to, the scenes I see, the, the way light falls upon a, a mountain range or some trees or an ocean. It's a beautiful way to uh, capture those things and uh, enjoy them for years to come. So if you have a desire to paint very interesting scenic landscapes, scenes that uh, everyone can relate to, this will be a perfect video for you to watch and for you to learn from. Well, that is Michael Holter painting watercolor from photographs. You can learn more about the full length video at streamline.art. And remember, we have a discount code for you today only, and it's up in the comments section. Make sure to take advantage of that. Now let's get right to our interview with Michael Holter. So my journey in the world of art began many years ago. Um, 
not with much formal education, unfortunately, early on, but eventually, uh, in college, I began to get some courses and learn some things and uh, developed a real love for, for art and for, uh, for the whole process of being a creative person. I uh, got a degree and taught art for about seven years in high schools, junior highs, and then switched over to more of a commercial side. I got a master's degree and went to, um, into the world of uh, communication and uh, using uh, my talents, my gifts to lead creative teams uh, got into more into graphic design and that kind of thing. All the, all the while I was painting and creating art, mostly watercolor, but I did a lot of oils as well. And so eventually um, it turned out that it, I began to really focus on the art only and uh, began to really fall in love more and more with the process of painting watercolor. And today um, that's for all I do, I teach and I travel, uh, paint uh, paintings and do workshops. So that's part of the, the whole process of being creative for me in this, uh, in this world, being a, being a person who's willing to uh, take some risks and, and um, find some new ways to create. That's, that's always what I'm about. I remember when I was a child, uh, John Nagy was one of those uh, television artists that would come on and draw and you could buy the John Nagy art kits and I uh, always wanted one but never got one. So I was one of those kids that really loved to do art, uh, didn't have much experience in, in, uh, in much training, I should say. But the, uh, the experiences began to develop um, and I did have some family history of, of uh, people involved in art. A couple of my aunts were uh, artists, one was a commercial artist. And so I had some, uh, some background in a sense but no training. So my love of art really began in earnest when I, when I really began to paint a lot after my, um, my years of uh, the college and training. I got into a, a, a series of uh, episodes in my life where I was painting, uh, traveling uh, to art shows and, and uh, exhibiting and uh, painted a lot, painted quite a lot at that time. It was a very rewarding period. So I'm a a uh, impressionist really and uh, my, my work is uh, representational I, I, I represent real places real people but I try to interpret them with a lot of uh, with the use of color and in unique ways and uh, with a, a looseness of brush stroke I don't uh, try to be a realist in the sense of a photorealist and I don't try to be a totally non-objective abstract painter. So I fall in, in the middle somewhere, which I think puts me in that camp of being an impressionist. Beginner artists often feel frustrated because they don't know quite what to do with their art. Uh, they know they want to create something, but they have uh, a lot of frustration getting it out and wanting to be something they maybe aren't, trying to be a perfectionist. And sometimes in the world of art, you just have to do it and uh, develop along the way. Uh, one of the things that's probably unique about me and my experience is that uh, I do have a, a foundation in, in some areas of commercial art and graphic design and uh, design is an important part of my uh, thinking process and my creative output. So I think uniquely, uh, uh, I'm uniquely positioned many times to create uh, well-composed, well-designed art that uh, really has an appeal to a lot of people without really knowing the whys of why it is appealing. Um, because it's been composed well and designed well, I really like to uh, emphasize design when I'm teaching and the, uh, the best way to accomplish that, of course, is through lots of experience and pa practice and paying attention to some of the principles that are outlined uh, for us in, uh, in the literature. So anything um, special or unique about my approach to art really revolves around some of the things that are in me uh, through my experiences, but also because I really believe that God created me to be a creative person. There's a, a portion of us all that uh, has a spark. And in order for me to, to uh, use the abilities I have, I know that I have to draw on something that's beyond me. And I really have that as a, a, a something to lean back on when I feel like I'm struggling. It really helps to have a, a foundation 
and that's uh, true in the in your life, but also, of course, in your in your um, skills that you've developed. As far as the subjects that I like to paint, um, I do paint people. I paint figures. I love uh, finding uh, interesting faces to paint and, and uh, figures. A lot of times, um, I'll just take my camera and go where there are crowds of folks and. Uh, shoot a lot of pictures and just capture them in their in their element. Those are the best kinds of images for me when it comes to the people. When it comes to landscapes and other other subjects, I really am always looking for uh, interesting places, interesting um, uh, forms, if it's in nature. I love seeing the way light plays across anything, whatever it is. I'm a light and shadows painter, basically. And so I'm really looking for opportunities when I'm out searching with my camera particularly. If I'm doing plein air, it's another adventure of trying to pick out something that's paintable from all the things that are around you when you're out in plein air. But um, basically I'm looking for good contrast, good light and shadow um, objects that capture that and are and in many cases um, executable in a way that the viewer can get into it and enjoy it and see uh, what I see. So why do I paint? Why do the birds sing? I believe that whatever we have inside of us is has to come out. I was thinking about that one day when uh, I was listening to a meadowlark, you know, it's like, why in the world does that bird sing all those different uh, songs, or the mockingbird, I should say. And, uh, you know, you just wonder about that. They're just singing away. So wh what is it about? us as creatures, creative beings, that want to do that. We want to create, we want to uh, do that in one way or another, whether it's writing or music or whatever it is. And I love all these forms of creativity. And uh, for me, it turned into painting. I have a visual sense. And it's uh, become uh, something that is a great reward to me as I uh, develop more and as I uh, paint more and uh, just enjoy the process, enjoy learning. It's always, I'm always learning and it's a constant process uh, for those of us in the creative world to be constantly learning and growing. I believe that you find inspiration from a lot of different places. I am uh, uh, an artist who uh, likes to uh, observe what's around me and, and I, I love the way light plays on things. But my inspiration a lot of times comes from, from within. It's a, it's a feeling and a need to create. I do have a belief in, in God as a creator, and I, I, I believe that the creation that he put forth is just a, a marvelous, uh, marvelous thing to try to capture in paint and on, on, on uh, you know, any kind of form. Uh, and it's a, just a great way for me to express myself, and it's part of the process that I go through day by day living out this life. Well, that is Michael Holter, and the new video is called Watercolor from Photographs. I think it'll help you a lot. You can learn more about the full-length video at streamline.art. Remember, we have a special discount code for today only. and You can find that up in the comments section. Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. We'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Michael Holter, and welcome to my landscape workshop. In this workshop, I'll take you through many steps that uh, you'll find very helpful as you paint landscapes. I'll talk about depth and distance and atmosphere, talk about putting together images that uh, maybe are from different scenes altogether and putting them together into a, a, a reliable uh, subject. And we'll uh, talk about the colors needed and the way to proceed from uh, light to dark values. The uh, very unique thing about the way I present this workshop is that I will let you in on all the decision making that I go through. I will uh, really give you a sense of the steps taken and uh, sometimes even the mistakes I make as we go. It'll be a great way to learn. I love painting landscapes. They are a great way to uh, capture the places that I go and travel to, the scenes I see, the, the way light falls upon a, a mountain range or some trees or an ocean. It's a beautiful way to uh, capture those things and uh, enjoy them for years to come. So if you have a desire 
to paint very interesting scenic landscapes, scenes that uh, everyone can relate to. This will be a perfect video for you to watch and for you to learn from.